to start by acknowledging as we try and think beyond borders and our modern ideas of nation states tonight that we are all gathered on ancestral Lenape territory and in lands that have deep meanings and deep connections for Six Nations, Haudenosaunee people, and lots of indigenous peoples of the Northeast as well. Um, so tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about no ban on stolen land and how this might help us reframe and critique some of our contemporary debates about immigration. Over the past year, the American public has had urgent discussions about our current immigration system and international borders. And the debate has focused on really essential conversations like the ethics of forcibly deporting young children who've lived in the US for the majority of their lives, how the US economy relies on immigrant and undocumented labor, how immigrants are essential parts of our communities and the intellectual output and cultural <coughs> values of the US, and about the violent ways that deportations destroy American families. However, as we think about how to critique our current immigration systems, and we find ways to challenge and articulate policies and alternatives, it seems to me that we're still operating within the flawed ideologies of a settler colonial state. And it seems that our conclusions are still based on the fundamental premise that the US has a natural and unchallenged right to this land. And therefore, the federal government is the only entity that has the right to determine who stays, who goes, and to carve borders and walls into the face of this land. So what I'm asking you to do tonight, then, is to think beyond a settler colonial framework, to reposition ourselves, and to think of this not so much as American citizens, as documented or undocumented, but for a moment to think of us as foreigners who are occupying indigenous lands and how unless we challenge the fundamental framework that undergirds our current immigration debate, we're also participating in the work of settler colonialism that supports our current exclusionary policies. So in February of 2017, indigenous scholars and activists Nick Estes and Melanie Yazzie, who are here behind me um, on the screen, joined a protest at Los Angeles International Airport. This was right after President Donald Trump had issued an executive order banning all travelers from Syria and 90-day bans for travelers from Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, Iraq, Libya, and Iran. Dr. Estes is Lower Brule of the Great Sioux Nation, a historian who's currently a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, and he's here wearing jeans and a t-shirt that says, Indigenous Resistance is Ceremony, with an upside down flag that's a nod to the American Indian movement and to the national symbol of distress. Y uh, Melanie Yaze is, Yazzie is a Diné, um, you probably know that more as Navajo, professor of gender and sexuality studies at UC Riverside, and she's here wearing cat-eyed glasses and a pair of Converse's. Both are carrying handmade cardboard signs that bore messages in bright red paint. Esty's sign says, no ban on stolen land, while Yazzie's proclaims, refugees welcome on native land. The message is simple, but the critique of US foreign policy is powerful and multi-layered. By reminding the public that the land where we live now and work is and was indigenous territory, we are reminded that US claims to this land are both relatively recent and predicated upon the forceful dispossession of native people. Furthermore, that the US's own claims to this territory and presence on this land is still deeply contested. Critically, as we consider bands and walls and national conversations, we must not remove native peoples and histories from this conversation. The intentional erasure of native people from public spaces and national narratives has led us to assume that the US is the only entity that gets to claim these spaces and that it is the inherent right of the government to welcome certain kinds of migrants, perhaps white or Christian or exclusively those from Norway, while excluding, restricting, and placing quotas on other kinds of newcomers. In contrast, then, by including Native people and respecting Native sovereignty, we not only support America's original and rightful inhabitants in their struggles against colonial borders, walls, and state power, but we challenge the claims of the US to their land and to make exclusionary policies. Essentially, by putting Native people back in the conversation and remembering Native origins and claims to the polities of North America, we critically reframe this conversation about borders and immigrations and more effectively challenge US justifications for exclusion.
So let's first start with the border in the Southwest, where so much of the national conversation has been focused in recent months and weeks. In the 17th century, before the U.S. was born, the Southwest was controlled by Apaches, Caddo's, Comanches, and many other native people. And contrary to popular imaginings, these are not nomadic people who roamed the plains seeking only to raid and pursue buffalo, but rather groups that did indeed have specific homelands and territories that they controlled and reserved for exclusive sets of use. So rather than thinking of these polities as bordered nation states, we should think of them as people with specific sets of relationships to each other and to land and resources. And this here includes non-human ancestors like buffalo, includes waters, includes mountains. So people who are tightly bound to place, but not in the bordered way we think of nation states today. So and in many cases, especially in eastern Texas, where there were many smaller Cadoan and other groups, native people had ways of sharing resources which was not to say, we'll carve the resources in half, but by forming relationships with newcomers and other groups, they brought them into their webs of relationships that allowed shared use for all. So by turning people into relatives. In effect, this looks a bit like overlapping sovereignties that are so fundamental to the way that we sometimes think about borderlands. And here I don't mean a frontier, but I mean overlapping jurisdictions and sovereignties where it's a little bit, there's room and there's space for many kinds of people and jurisdictions. So then during the 18th century, further west in the harsh lands of what is now West Texas, as the US is growing and expanding its empire in the east, the Comanches built an empire on the plains, and with strategic raids, they helped garner cru the crucial resources and keep the Spanish settlers moving north from Mexico in check. Um, and so Comanches effectively halted the spread of Spanish dominion northward and maintained control of large swaths of what is now Texas. Okay, so this is important because primarily, because during the early 19th century, after the Louisiana Purchase, the Mexican government was so desperate to finally gain control of this territory that it invited U.S. and American settlers to come and settle in eastern Texas so that they could finally outpopulate Comanche people and take control of this region. This, is the foundation, this laid the foundation for the Republic of Texas to be formed in the early 19th century. Um, right, and then Texas annexation in the mid-19th century, which led to the U.S.-Mexico war, war, uh, war and created the border that we're much more familiar with. So in essence, what I'm suggesting here is part of the reason the border looks the way it does today was a response to Comanche power in the southwest and on the plains. Then, of course, we all know the famous tales of Geronimo and in the 19th century how the U.S. pursued Apache and Comanche people to their death as it waged a war to either kill or corral all Native people who remained to claim these lands. So how does this relate? For years, the border crossed us has been a cry of settlers in the southern part of the North American continent. The critique there being that this imperial border that severed community and that his, um, Hispanic people who had been living there for long before the US dumped a border that divided families and separated states. However, if we expand on this even further, we come to see that the border also severed indigenous territories and US claims attempted to negate native sovereignty and rights to claim both these lands and forge relationships across empires in this indigenous way that binds people together with connections. Thus, if we take a deep history look at the borderlands and long legacy of indigenous presence in the region, the border is not only a relatively recent phenomenon, but it's also fundamentally at odds with earlier models that recognize shared patterns of resource use and sometimes overlapping jurisdictions. And it reminds us that the claims were acquired only by slaughtering tens of thousands of native people. But native challenges to borders did not simply die in the 19th century, and as so much of our American mythos would lead us to believe, rather they remain hotly contested through present day. Although native people have experienced tremendous levels of violence and dispossession at the hands of the federal government, the US did not in fact succeed at wiping out native people or extinguishing native claims to territories. And if the 19th century was marked by US efforts to eradicate Native Americans, the 20th century was framed by less explicitly violent but no less insidious processes of eradicating indigenous people and indigeneity and dismantling Native nations and thereby the sovereign separate status which Native nations hold and which pre-exist the US. <laughs> 
So in 1924, the federal government granted citizenship, granted in heavy quotes here, to all Native Americans living within U.S. borders. And to be clear, many Native people did see this as a positive move, right? It gave their children rights to independently own and control land, which prior to this point they couldn't. They needed guardians. It gave people the right to vote, right, to own land and to participate in school systems off reservation. However, for many other Native people, especially those who lived within their sovereign lands in independent territories, and especially, especially where they had fought long and hard to avoid removals and dispossessions, right? People like the Diné, people like the descendants of the Sioux Nation, people like the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, who are all still on the same territory they've been on forever. Um, they viewed the citizenship not only as illegal, but also as a fundamental threat to Native sovereignty. And so some Native people completely rejected U.S. citizenship insisting that they could not simply be forced into the U.S. and converted into U.S. citizens without their consent. As Aquasane Aqua, Mohawk um, Charles Benedict argued in 1941 when he explained the rejection of U.S. citizenship by Mohawk nationals, the assumption that the U.S. could incorporate Native people simply by passing laws or claiming to have jurisdiction over their territory was patently absurd. Citizenship, he argues, cannot possibly apply to Indians, meaning Iroquois, because they are independent nations. Congress may as well pass a law making Mexicans citizens. In effect, if the U.S. could turn foreign nationals and their people into domestic territories and citizens, the U.S. could then claim the resources held by these people and the right to implement legal restrictions on their behalf and the right to control their territories and place borders through their lands. Thus, many Native people completely rejected U.S. citizenship and refused to recognize this colonial reimagining of their people's relationships to their lands, to each other, and to the United States. Although we think about border issues mostly and frequently for most of us in terms of the U.S.-Mexico border, some of the clearest examples of indigenous rejection of colonial borders in practice uh, comes from the northern U.S., where it passes through lands controlled by the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, also known as the Iroquois. Today, the Six Nations are located um, on reservations and reserves near Lake Ontario and Lake Erie and live across this border. And they continue to reject the right of the U.S. state to divide this ground. So unlike the United States, which was formed in the late 18th century as Euro-American settlers refashioned their identities and reimagined their territories as part of a new state, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy formed in the 15th century before the arrival of Columbus, more than 300 years before the U.S. And so for all intents and purposes, for more than 500 years, the Six Nations have controlled the same territory in what's now northern New York and Canada. Therefore, any serious consideration of sovereignty should conclude that the right of the six nations of Oneidas, Tuscaroras, Onondagas, Senecas, Cayugas, and Mohawks to control these lands far pre-exist and therefore supersede the rights of the U.S. to control these lands. And I love this. So each year, the federal government has to sit down with the leaders of the Iroquois Nation and bring them $4,500 worth of cloth, bundles of cloth, um, and they do this every February, and it's terrible cloth. These Six Nations people have really no practical use for it. I mean, the U.S. government's not buying them, like, crushed velvet, right? This is, this is crummy cloth. But the purpose of this and all of this useless cloth is it forces the U.S. government to recognize the 1794 treaty that these nations signed with the federal government, ensuring that the government would always recognize their land claims and would always continue to pay them in cloth as it had in the 18th century. And this is a document, again, 1794 would be right after the U.S. is born as a state. And so by forcing the federal government to go through these rituals of recognition, the Six Nations are effectively reminding them each year that this is, a, this is an agreement and this is a situation that has long preceded their country. In effect, the Six Nations are engaged in what Mohawk scholar Audra Simpson has called the politics of refusal. They refuse to change the way they identify. They refuse to use other citizenships or identities. They refuse to change the way they relate to their lands and their relatives across the border. And they refuse 
to recognize the imposition of colonial law. Six Nations people, some of the Iroquois folks, still travel on Iroquois passports, right, and assert in international realms their identity and their territories as Haudenosaunee people, not as Americans, not as Canadians. They declare war when the U.S. goes to war independently and in conjunction with the states. They are a separate nation. By refusing to recognize these later borders as more valid claims than the claims of the Kanawake Mohawk groups within, the Mohawks present a fundamental challenge to the U.S. and Canada's claims to these lands and their rights to impose a border and regulate migration through their territory. And the Mohawk and Haudenosaunee are, at lar are, are large, but they're certainly not the only nation to critique colonial borders. Native nations in the Southwest, like the Diné, for example, whose territory, again, Navajo, stretches between Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona, have long fought attempts um, by ICE and other immigration agencies to exercise control on their territories within their own borders. And in a recent highly publicized case in early 2017, as Trump promised to build his border wall, the vice president of the Tohono O'odham Nation again challenged federal attempts to enforce this colonial border. The Tohono O'odham have territory, community, and families that stretch across the U.S. and Mexico border and have controlled and lived off these lands long before the U.S. created a border across them. Therefore, Vice Chairman Verlon Jose lashed back at this proposition and announced that only over my dead body will a wall be built through Tohono O'odham lands. Jose's statement was picked up by the national media and celebrated by immigrants and American-born citizens alike. The critique of federal policy using indigenous sovereignty again demonstrates the power of these narratives in challenging the normalization of imperial borders and exclusionary settler colonial politics. All of this is to say that beyond thinking about who gets documents, who gets citizenship, what materials the wall should be built of, and how to police these borders, we need, to ask the fundam we need to question the fundamentals of the borders of a colonial state and the assumption that the settler government is the, of the US is the only group with a right to police these lands and withhold or force citizenship onto peoples of North America. So how is it that we have missed this critical part of the conversation so far? And why is it that we still really don't take native claims to sovereignty seriously? The project of indigenous eradication and erasure is deeply bound up in the national project to claim vacated native lands and thereby assert sovereignty over the lands that now compose the US. So let me pause for a minute. I wanna emphasize that the slogan, we are all immigrants here, is very helpful in reminding so many settlers and those of us who are also of settler descent that our families too immigrated to this land to seek better lives. Many of our parents and grandparents faced discrimination or marginalization because they spoke different languages, had practiced different religions, had skin, hair, or even clothes that marked them as somehow different from our idealized imaginings of our white Christian founding mothers and fathers. However, we must be very careful with this refrain. We must be careful not to erase the experiences of the hundreds of thousands of captive and enslaved Africans who were dragged to this continent and brutally exploited as their labor built the structures that created the US society and economy we know today. And we must be careful in insisting that everyone today was an immigrant at some point to erase the very existence of native people within our midst and thereby their claims to territory. So scholars, uh, Jeannie O'Brien and Phil Deloria have written extensively about how the project of erasing native peoples um, and the critical implications of this. Um, and so in effect, I've broken this down into a couple of parts, but you can think of the sort of big categories of this erasure eradicus, erat, eradicization project as writing Indians out of history, right? Making them show up when the pilgrims arrive and then be defeated in the Plains Wars and be gone. Moving native people out of view, making sure there are no public monuments, public current celebrations of indigenous heritage, no public academics, no public artists. Um, propagating myths that all of the real Indians are dead, so that every time that you see an Indian, you ask, how much are you? What are you doing off reservation? You don't look leathered and feathered. And insisting that Indians cannot be modern, that all real Indians must exist in some primordial state and to be modern, to exist within a modern economy, to be able to use money, 
which is right, the same argument that Indians couldn't be modern and therefore they couldn't be part of the US and therefore they had to be removed. Right? We have to keep Indians in the past as things that don't fit within the state. So Indians cannot possibly mo be modern. And then the final project of racializing Indians. So making Indians into things that can be bled out so that your sovereignty can be diluted over the course of generation, rather than thinking of them as nations, in which case nations cannot bleed out. So collectively, this constellation of racialization, erasure, and anti-modernism undermines native sovereignty and helps support our national myths that sustain the ideology that justifies the US and its colonial borders and land claims. To illustrate how visibility is such a critical part of this conversation, let's just return to the image that we started with, Dr. Yazzie and Dr. Estes at the airport. On these signs, you can see that in addition to the powerful articulations of native sovereignty and the indigenous right to welcome people onto their own territories on their own terms, they've printed a handprint and an arrow. In effect, they needed to use some form of iconography that we recognize as fundamentally indigenous or native that codes as Indian so that we can validate them as real Indian people and therefore understand and hear their critique. In effect, they need to first be visible as modern native people before we can hear the critique of settler colonialism and exclusionary land claims. I made a point to emphasize Estes and Yazzie's dress and presentation at the beginning of this talk because so often we're unable to recognize and see native people unless they are dressed and behaving in the ways that we expect native people to be behaving, unless they are dancing, unless they are feathered, unless they are on reservation. And this is almost in some ways worse in urban spaces like New York or light L LAX because of all of the kinds of people you expect to meet. You don't expect to cross paths with indigenous people. Yes, we wear squash blossoms necklaces or beaded bolo ties or ribbon shirts, but we also wear Nikes and sequined cocktail dresses and flannel t-shirts. At LAX, where Yazzie and Estes arrived to protest the immigration ban, how many people do you think would have expected to cross paths with that afternoon with a living, breathing Indian? What would be their first reaction? To ask how much? To assume this is not real because they're not on the reservation? To question their claims? To make these critiques? Basically, part of the first step in reorienting our thinking and reimagining our spaces as deeply indigenous and rooted in deep indigenous histories of connections and other kinds of relations beyond nation states um, is learning to recognize that today indigenous people look like other modern humans. We come in all colors, with all kinds of hair, we're short and tall, we speak with southern drawls or Brooklyn accents, or at home in our own communities in the languages of our people. The point is, that these struggles for visibility are overlapping. And as we talk about coming out of the shadows and making American immigrants and undocumented folks not only visible but celebrated parts of our communities, we also need to think about how we can celebrate and recognize the native people of this land. In doing so then, we're not just stuck arguing over the number of visas or what, to what extent a kinship network goes beyond a basic and essential family unit, um, who you should be allowed to live with, how much money we're willing to invest in border control, but we challenge the entire ideology and system that place borders onto your people and mine. Thus, we, as we move forward and talk about new ways of imagining relationships to each other, to these places, and visions for what the US will look like in the coming years, I urge you to remember that this state is not the only state that claims the land between the East River and San Francisco. But, to do, but also another 500 plus nations claims, whose, whose claims all precede those of our current government. Mishi Newe, thank you.